My name is Jackson Cunningham, and this is the Cunningham Musical Instrument Shop. And we're working on a little small body guitar for the Floyd Country Store and the Handmade Music School. This is a project that we started in the fall and began cutting the back and the braces and stuff and getting this stuff all put together this fall. And we're looking at trying to get this done in the spring sometime. And this is just a little guitar. It's going to go up for auction to uh, benefit the Handmade Music School and the Floyd Country Store. And we just thought we'd show you a little bit about what goes into this guitar and, and the processes and the woods and all that stuff. And... This is a typical early 30s bracing pattern. And right now we've, we've glued these on with hot high glue, kind of a rough shape, and we're just gonna fine tune the graduations. Um, number one for the edges to kind of meet the rims and, and meet up with the rest of the body. But we're also, this is one of the more critical points of building a guitar is making a judgment on how stiff this wood is and the weight and the thicknesses and how it all vibrates and stuff. So I'm gonna kind of take my time on this and, and shave these and shape them um, just to how I see fit, how I think that this top really wants to work. And I'll kind of go in here. These are all red spruce, just like the top. And I wanna shave these down. Shave them all down so they kind of meet up. Right. And I don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time sanding braces. A lot of people do. I, I mostly do chisel work and, and planes. And leave it a little bit rough cut. Sometimes I like seeing traces of edge tools better than I do sandpaper even that my chisels are sharp. Um, almost all the construction for the guitar is, is done with hot high glue. That's the norm. That's the traditional violins were put together that way and um, steel string guitars um, in the 20s and 30s and stuff. High glue is kind of the normal. It's easy to work with. It's acoustically, I think it's the best for sound transmission. It can, be, it can clean up really nicely. You can make it any consistency you want, uh, stronger or weaker, or thicker or thinner, and um, and that's what I use. All my guitars and fiddles and banjos. Everything's going to kind of make a difference in tone. You know, the thickness of the top, the the um, the braces on how thin they're carved, and how um, how tall and wide they are. Some braces are thicker and lower, and some are taller and skinnier they kind of taper up, they kind of get skinny. I like them to be skinnier and taller is what I, I like in a brace. Um, and you can, you just, you basically loosening and tightening the top is what you're doing. You know, you, you gotta make a judgment call on whether you think there's too much, it's too stiff or too loose. And you kind of have a starting point with these braces that you saw out on the table saw, and then you, you kind of loosen it up with the chisel. You kind of just blend everything in and, um, and that's kind of, um, that's, you know, one of the big things you get with experience is just building a lot of guitars and um, getting an idea for how they're gonna sound. And the brace stock too, you might use brace stock that's, you know, that's a lot harder and denser than, um, than others. And so we've used red spruce, the same as the top on this one. And that's, and that's all I've ever used is red spruce on all my braces. I think for most instrument makers, guitar makers, or this is probably like the most, one of the most like artistic and funnest parts of building an instrument. Um, you know, there's a lot of tedious, tedious jobs involved with the whole building process, but I think working with the wood and 
and something that's so crucial to the sound is pretty, pretty fun stuff for me anyhow. trick on this stuff here is just to try to get it at a good point where it's um, resonates really good and it's got um, optimal strength so you know you don't want it too heavy um, because it won't it won't vibrate and ring um, and too thin it won't stand up under the string tension so we're just trying to I'll tap it and stuff like that try to kind of tune it this one sounds pretty good it's pretty close this piece of wood here is probably about five years old. Um, you just want to make sure that it's nice and dry before you turn it into a guitar. I helped harvest some of this stuff. It's from the mountains in North Carolina. You know, all my musical heroes and stuff played, you know, I mean, Martin, Jan Gibson's and lots of traditional and locally built instruments as well. But um, that's kind of the main reason I, I build these things because of the music, that's what it's inspired by and stuff. And um, you know, when I first got into building this stuff, it was too expensive to buy my own guitar. So I just figured I'd try to make one. And when I settled here about 15 years ago, I started um, meeting people in the community and realizing that there was, I mean, there was instrument makers all over the place out here. And just like the music and the musicians, there was um, people who were willing to help me and um, get me started. And um, everything from showing me secrets to, to building to um, giving me tone wood that they had and um, just a real supportive uh, community of people and encouraging um, to keep the tradition going, you know, to hand it down and make sure it doesn't die out. I grew up in Southern Oregon, and I grew up with a lot of music in, in my household, and my stepdad was a woodworker and a craftsman. And from, from the earliest I can remember, there was woodworking projects, you know, everywhere. There was, they logged timber on the property and had a chainsaw mill, and, and that was, you know, went into building a timber frame house. And so I can remember piles of sawdust and stuff and working out in the shop. and. So I've been around it, you know, my whole life, you know, doing woodwork and stuff. And I played music most of my life, too. So um, I think it was just a matter of time before I kind of did the two things kind of blended together. And then when I when I met Audrey Hashham, that was like the, the beginning of it. I think she was really super helpful and uh, just encouraging. You know, you go up to her shop and bring something you're working on and you'd you'd leave feeling like, you know, that thing was worth a million bucks or something, you know? I mean, looking back on it, probably wasn't the greatest instrument in the world, but like when I was first starting, it meant, it meant the world for her encouragement and stuff like that. And all this wood you see up here, I think just about all this stuff is from the mountains around here. Some of this stuff's Virginia from just right up here. North Carolina, um, some's from West Virginia. And, um, this particular piece on this one, I do believe, I think it's from Maggie Valley, North Carolina. And, um, and it's, it's, I think, red spruce about all I've used on these little LOs. Um, it's a really good, really good tone wood. Um, and that's Honduran mahogany. I kind of picked out as a nice looking piece that would look good. Kind of the standard that they were using in the 30s. Um, it's still fairly easy to get. It's really easy to work with, and um, it's a good, good resonant wood. So I got a whole stash of this wood. I got this from a couple fellas, um, Matt and Nathan Hampton. They work with John Arnold, 
and um, they source a lot of this red spruce, um, a lot of its old growth or second growth red spruce. I don't know if it was this actual piece, but most of this stuff I got, I went down there and helped them cut it, and and um, most of this stuff was it's like growing on like sides of like mountains and stuff where they, I guess they couldn't get helicopters in. It was too dangerous to log it, you know, back in the 20s. Or So we went in by hand. We rode four-wheelers up there and then um, hiked down the side of the mountain and cut these billets of uh, timber, which a billet is kind of like a, a, a two-foot piece of wood, you know, chopped into quarters or something like that. It's, it's you know, super wet, so super heavy, but we'd put it in backpacks and uh, and just hike it off the side of these mountains and uh, it was pretty brutal it's all selective kind of selective logging too it's low impact um you know we're just hiking in there and taking a tree out from here and here and, um but i like having that connection to it it's 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 local wood um and it's air dried so it's cut and it's dried you know it's not kiln dried it's just set aside for for years to um to dry it, it makes great, makes really good, makes really good guitars, and I made fiddles out of it too. So, um, so now we're gonna we're gonna take this uh, mahogany neck, and I've already done kind of fit this fit this in already, but as you can see here, you kind of just I got it roughed out and um, and fit to the body here. I don't know if you can kind of see that, but it's kind of curly, curly mahogany to kind of fit the back and sides. And we just fit that in there and make a nice strong joint right there. there that's a piece of Brazilian rosewood, kind of a fancy showpiece for all you Gibson lovers. Rosewood fretboard there, and so we'll we got that nice and fit in there. We'll take it over and we'll carve on a little bit. A neck like this, typically what I do with a with a customer who wants a, you know, somebody orders a guitar or something, a lot of times, like I said, they could go out and buy an old vintage guitar, but um, really to personalize it, the main one of the main things that they're gonna ask for is the neck to be exactly how they like it. So I'll get like a set of measurements from somebody. I typically ask somebody just to measure a guitar they really like on the neck and just measure the, the dimensions of it, how wide it is, how thick it is. Um, and then I got like a series of, a series of little templates that I use offer different guitars that I've copied them from, you know, heel templates and stuff like that, that I've, that's off of 1933 L5. All sorts of stuff that I use to get that, to get that just right and then I'll, um, Typically, just try to get a measurement down here and get another one up here, um, and just start and start working it down until it feels till it feels like it's right. You know, whether somebody wants a V neck or they want a C profile or um, they want it thicker on this end. You know, it's just that's all super personalized and custom stuff. I've got kind of a standard slight V that I do that I feel is real comfortable for most people. And then, you know, somebody could go buy a 1930s guitar if they wanted an old guitar, but if you want something that suits your hands just perfect, 
you know, if you have trouble finding an old old guitar that just, you know, oh, I love the sound of it, but the neck just doesn't feel right, you know, that's, I think, one of the reasons why you have somebody custom build you an instrument, because we can do the neck exactly the way you want it. So this one, I'll probably do like a standard slight V. So this stuff, I mean, this is stuff is kind of what I enjoy the most, the woodworking aspect, the building guitars. It's kind of like the rough framing or something. You can really make progress real fast and you can really see it. And I'm really excited about this guitar. I think it's gonna be a really nice, really nice project and we're looking forward to it.